Fantastic. Right, okay. So we are in week two of a series we are calling, and it will come up behind me, This Changes Everything, where we are exploring the way in which the resurrection that we see in the Easter story changes the way in which we live now. And this morning's message is entitled Beyond Fear and Doubt. So for those of you who are note takers and who love to make notes, you can write that down as today's title, Beyond Fear and Doubt. I'm just going to quickly um, invite the Holy Spirit to speak. Holy Spirit, speak to us by your words. Holy Spirit, we pray that we would be open to hear what you have to say. Amen. Well, the New Testament scholar and theologian N.T. Wright, writing about Easter, says this, and this is so good, um, I asked for it to be put on, on the screen so you can kind of see that too. Um, he says this, left to ourselves, and he's speaking to the Christian community, the Christian church here. He says, left to ourselves, we lapse into a kind of collusion with entropy acquiescing in the general belief that things may be getting worse, but there's nothing much that we can do about them. I love what he then says, and we are wrong. Our task in the present is to live as resurrection people who are living in between Easter and the final day when Jesus comes again and with our Christian life, both corporately as a community, but also personally and individually in both our worship and our mission as a sign of the first and a foretaste of the second. What N.T. Wright is capturing here is this, that our task as Christians in the 21st century is to live as a resurrection people, to live as a people who recognize that Easter is the turning point in the Christian story. It is the beginning of a brand new future. It is the recreation that God has been prophesying and it has landed. And we are called as the people of God, both in our thinking, in our bodies, in our actions, to embody this truth that everything has changed, is changing, and will be fully changed when Jesus returns. In other words, we are called to declare with every aspect of our life that this changes everything, that everything has now changed, that we live both in the reality that we currently see in front of us, but there is a truer reality, which is actually the true reality that we are called by the power of the Holy Spirit to carry in ourselves and actually bring into the world around us. C.S. Lewis writing about this, he spoke of the world in which we live and, we, and he said, this is just the shadow lands. In other words, it is the shadow of the reflected glory of God that we cannot fully see yet, and we live in the shadow of that. And there are moments as Christians, there are moments in our lives where we glimpse the kingdom of God breaking into our worlds in miracles, in answered prayer. We have seen over this year there are testimonies and testimony after testimony of miracles that God is doing in this church community. Even since our church family gathering that we had just a month ago, we have heard people testify that I have seen a breakthrough in my world. I've seen a breakthrough in my health. We are seeing just the foretaste, as N.T. Wright talks about, of the kingdom of God breaking in. And I'm here to declare, as a resurrection people, we are called to hold on to that reality because that is the real reality. It is simply yet to be fully revealed. And so in this series, we are exploring, well, how do we live like that? How do we live 
present in front of us, that everything that our eyes are telling us, this isn't the real reality. This is only the shadow of reality. How do we live with that? Not as it were, you know, the positive thinking optimism that the world offers us, but how do we live with radical faith and love that transforms and changes the world in which we live? And today I want to explore a topic that I feel is really, really important. And the topic is fear and doubt. Because if you are a human in this room, everyone a human? No, no, no aliens, no aliens disguising yourself as humans. If you are a human being, I'm going to start with the bad news, guys. The bad news is, is you are going to experience fear and doubt for your whole life. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I know, boo indeed. <laughs> but here's the thing. The world out there lives in the presence of fear and doubt, and ultimately it has no answer. The good news I have for you today is the fact that the Christian reality, the Christian story is, is that there is an answer to fear and doubt. Can I hear an amen? <laughs> oh, brilliant. There is... Whilst we will live in the presence of fear and doubt, because of the resurrection of Jesus, the power of fear and doubt has been broken. We are called both prophetically and in reality to live as a people who live in our thinking, in our spirit, in our hearts, in a place beyond fear and doubt. And this morning, I want to say to every single one of you, my prophetic declaration for every single one of you, no matter what your personal story is with fear and doubt, whether right now as you come to church, you actually have some very real fears that you are facing. Maybe you've had a diagnosis and you're like, well, my father had this condition. Now they're telling, now the doctor's telling me that you've got the chromosomes for that condition and it could be. And it feels like a sentence hanging over you. Yes, nothing's happened yet, but you live in the fear of that. You live in the uncertainty of that. Maybe this week, you know, your boss sat you down and said, look, I've got, I'm really sorry, but um, everyone's having to take a pay cut. And you're suddenly realizing, do you know what? I need to learn, I need to figure out how can we live with less? Like being human is to be filled with fear and doubt. But I want to say that what the scripture we are going to read today, we're going to see both fear and doubt. But we are also going to see how we can move beyond fear and doubt and into personal, vibrant, powerful faith. The image I had was this. Sometimes when we make fear and doubt, it's like, Fear and doubt is written on a piece of paper. But then when Jesus comes, it's like the life of Jesus swallows up the fear and doubt until it's gone away. And he replaces it with this vibrant, powerful, living faith. So I want to say to every single one of us, Yes, you will experience fear and doubt. Yes, you may even be experiencing some real fear and doubt this morning. But I believe the Holy Spirit is saying, this morning he has come to break the power of that fear, to break the power of that doubt over you and lead you into life beyond doubt and fear. I just felt led to say, particularly for our young people in the room, I think you are growing up in a generation of doubt and fear where you are called to question everything, where you are called to believe that essentially the world out there has nothing really to offer because everything's just complicated and there's wars and this is going up and people are worried about money and people are worried about this and people are worried about that. And do your friends like you? Um, what, why didn't they text you? All the rest of this kind of stuff. And this is... This is a world in which we live. I believe that the good news of Jesus for us today is the fact that you do not need to live 
like the rest of the world in that fear and doubt. You do not need to be in the prison of fear and doubt where you are. And there may be people in here, you have honest questions around your faith and you feel like the church has never really truly answered your questions. Why does Jesus allow, why does this this morning, I believe that what, what, what God wants to do is he wants to break in by the power of his Holy Spirit and he wants to answer your doubts and fears. And I believe that the passage that we're going to read shows us exactly how we can deal with our doubt and fear and how we can move forward into living powerful faith. Let's turn in our Bibles to John 20 verses 19 to 29. And I'm reading from the NIV. Many of you will be surprised because I like the NLT. <sighs> oh. Guys, I love the Bible. I love all versions of the Bible. I love the NLT, I love the NIV. NKGV, not so much, but that's just because it's got lots of these and thys and thous. I'm like, I don't speak like that anymore. <coughs> I do, I know. But I was, I'm an English teacher, but I'm not 400 years old, Evan. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> Maybe by the power of Christ, I will be one day. Um, John 20, verses 19 to 29. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked, notice, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. This passage begins with the disciples and they are full of fear. Jesus, look at what happens though. Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Side note before we read any further. You want to pay particular attention to verse 23. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. Do you know what Jesus got put on a cross for? He got put on a cross because. He, is that me? He got, yeah, probably is. I've been saying yes, it is you. Stop moving. Um, he got put on a cross because he dared to say, I can forgive sins. And the Jewish leader says, no, you can't. Only God can do that. Look at what Jesus says here. If you forgive anyone's sins, Jesus is saying, what I have been given the power to do, I am giving you the power to do. Now, we can't forgive the penalty of sin. Only Jesus can do that. But the amazing thing is, is that God is saying, no matter what the offense is, God has given you by the power of his Holy Spirit the ability to forgive. Like, how incredible is that? Jesus trusts you with the power to forgive someone. And if he trusts you with that, you've got to know he trusts you with other things too. Then Jesus appears to Thomas, verse 24. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, which means twin, one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. Actually, the original Greek verb there is kind of like in the present continuous tense. So it's more like we have seen the Lord. 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 Uh, you kind of think to Thomas, like, I get it. You've seen the Lord. <laughs> but look at what he says. Thomas then says to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger where the nails were, put my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, so a whole week goes by, later the disciples are in the house again. And Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, 
Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Notice, Jesus says exactly the same thing over Thomas as he said over the disciples when Thomas wasn't there. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand, put it in my side, stop doubting, and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. This narrative and this encounter is packed with so much that is helpful as we consider how we can deal with doubt and fear. But the first thing I want to acknowledge here is that there is a very real fear for these disciples. They have witnessed the moment of Palm Sunday of Jesus triumphantly entering Jerusalem. And I think for most of them at that point, they thought, this is it. This is the moment we are going to overthrow the Roman Empire. God is going to move in power. We've all heard the stories. We've heard the story of how God moved powerfully and changed Pharaoh's heart, and we were set free. We don't know how God's going to do it, but we believe this is it. Fast forward a couple of days. The king, who is announced by the crowd, becomes the one who dies on a cross. And in that moment, the hopes die, but also fear is birthed. If they did that to Jesus, what will they do to me? I was with him. People know I was with him. And they all scatter, they all run away. But interestingly, despite that, on this day, the first day, notice it says in the Bible, on the first day of the week. The first day of the week should really have been the previous day. But here's what happens. Jesus rewrites history. And what used to be the first day of the Sabbath, actually Sunday becomes the first day. Because in Jewish tradition, Saturday is the Sabbath. But Jesus rewrites the story and he makes Sunday the first day. Because he's saying the first day begins not in death, not in the confusion of silent Saturday, but in the resurrection of Sunday. Church, your life does not end in fear and doubt. Your life does not end in the confusion of silent Saturday. Your life is birthed out of the resurrection of the first day, the Sunday, and that prophetic statement is still true today and as we read these words we see what are the disciples doing they are locked for fear of the jewish leaders we pick it up in verse 19 again they've locked the door for fear that the jewish leaders will find them but look at what happens despite the door being locked look at what happens jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Jesus is the four firstborn of the brand new creation. He is the firstborn of recreation. And what Jesus shows us is that when you are for the firstborn of recreation, you are the alloy of heaven and earth together. You can walk through doors. I don't know about you but I'm definitely praying for that. I would love to be able to walk through doors. It would be, sounds like an awesome skill. No, I just like, not to do it, not to like go and do it and like do anything bad. Just like, you know, like just, just when you get home, who wants to open a door? So much easier just to be able to walk through it. Don't need to get your keys out anymore. Jesus, I can just walk in straight through. <laughs> Sorry, I'm so geeky, moving on. Um, now. Here's the point. The point is the disciples are full of fear and doubt. They are hiding behind a locked door, but Jesus breaks in. 
the promise, the invitation for every single one of us today is this. Jesus' presence transforms doubts and fears into peace and joy. And that there is no locked door that Jesus cannot make his way through. It does not matter what your past story has been. It does not matter what you are currently struggling with in terms of doubts and fears, whether you are somebody who is like, I don't even know if this, this faith thing is real for me anymore. It may be you are struggling with doubts of like, this is my parents' faith, but I'm not sure if I want this to be my faith. Um, I want, or maybe you're actually just in a real difficult moment and where it feels like God is really distant and you're crying out, but it feels like God is silent. I want to say to you that what this passage shows us is this, is that Jesus can break through any door. There is no door that Jesus cannot break through. And when he breaks through, you don't need to do anything because the presence of Jesus is what transforms our doubt and fear into joy and peace. When Jesus comes through that door, he is not coming with condemnation. He is not coming to say over you, why haven't you got this yet? Don't you know who I am? That's not what Jesus says. Jesus comes through that door. He breaks in like the inbreaking of the kingdom of God right now, here today, 2,000 years later. Jesus wants to do exactly the same thing in your life, in my life, in whatever area we are struggling in with fear and doubt. Jesus is right now, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he is breaking into your heart and he is speaking those words over you and he's saying, peace be with you. I see your questions. I see your doubt. I see your fear. But look, look at me. Look at me. See the words that I'm speaking. My presence has come to transform your fear and doubt because there is a place beyond fear and doubt and it is a place of peace and joy. Peace and joy is the inheritance of every single Christian. It is not... The inheritance for Christians is not doubt and fear. Doubt and fear are what we have to wrestle with because we live in a world that is groaning for the fulfillment of recreation when Jesus comes again. The reason why you feel that sense of fear and doubt is because somewhere in your spirit you know this world should be better. I only see a shadow. I only see a moments of creativity and breakthrough and of love. And we do see those moments and we celebrate those moments. But the beautiful good news of the gospel is the fact that it can break through in us even when we have our doubt and fear. And let me tell you, when Jesus breaks in, your doubts and fears get their proper place. Because they must surrender to the joy, the life, and the victory of Christ. That is your inheritance. And I think we need to hear this because, you know, as humans, you know when we're going through a tough time, and I've seen this so often, and I, I, I sense this pull within my own heart. When I am struggling with doubt and fear and questions that God doesn't seem to be answering, do you know what I want to do more than anything else? I want to find a cave and hide. Not an actual cave, because it's cold in there. There's no running water. There's no central heating. There's no internet. Like, it's a terrible idea. But you get the point. I want to withdraw. I want to withdraw into myself. Because I feel like if I can just protect myself, then I'll be okay, won't I? And actually, our culture encourages this. Go away. Have a bit of me time. Maybe if you stare at yourself long enough, you might actually discover you'll find yourself and then you'll break through and it'll be like a giant flower blossoming. And you're like, like I hear it. And like from an artistic point of view, it sounds beautiful. But it's nonsense. It's not biblical. The Bible does not say look inside yourself and you will find the answer. The Bible says, look at Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith, and he, by the power of his presence, he will transform you from the inside out. Your situation may change, it may not. But you know what? When you are full of peace and joy, it doesn't matter what your situation is because you are full of peace and joy. Because when you look at Jesus, you see him speak over you, peace be with you. In other words, the fullness, the wholeness that Jesus is 
by the power of his Holy Spirit comes on you in that moment and it gives you, do you know what it gives you? It gives you confidence. Confidence that, do you know what? It doesn't matter what happens here because there's a deeper reality at work here. And even if this thing ends tragically, ends badly, all that's going to happen is, is that my earthly body is going to be taken away and what's going to be revealed is the fullness of who I truly am. For me personally, I've experienced this. For those of you who don't know, and I know many of you do, but I know that there are people in the room who don't. So um, I have a long-term medical condition. Um, I'm a photosensitive epileptic. And basically, since the age of nine, um, occasionally I've had moments in my life where I lose consciousness. And it's quite embarrassing because I don't do the kind of, I don't have the, the kind of epilepsy where you just go vacant for a bit and then you're back in the room again. Although I may be able to practice that without epilepsy, I don't know. Um, <laughs> moving on, <laughs> sorry. <coughs> Intrusive thoughts. Um, and basically, what that means is, is that what, those of you who know me will know, one of my great joys in life is driving. One of my great joys in life is driving. One of the things you can't do if you have a seizure as a photosensitive, photosensitive epileptic is drive a car. So I live in the reality that I know at some point, at some moment, it could happen that I could have a breakthrough seizure whereby I can no longer drive a car for a year. Do you know what I've realized? I've realized that I am healed. And the reason I'm healed is this. It's because I'm not looking at the reality in front of me. I'm looking at the reality where heaven and earth come back together, where Jesus comes. And the reality is, is whether the healing is today, whether the healing is tomorrow, whether the healing is in a week's time, whether the healing is at my death at some point. Do you know what? That reality is going to break through. And what I hold on to and what I keep in front and center saying, that is the true reality. The reality of what I actually face in this human reality right now, that is a result of sin and death. But do you know what? When Jesus comes again, sin and death will bow once more and it will no longer be that the power and sin of death is not at work it will be the presence of death and sin is extinguished once and for all and the peace and the joy and the love that God is will be fully revealed and guess what I get to live in that I won't even need to wear glasses at that point I'm pretty sure I'm going to have an eight pack and I'll be able to run at four and a half minutes a kilometer all the time there will be great food. I've read the Bible. It says there's a banquet. It says there's a giant mansion. I get to live with people I love all of the time, and I don't need a mortgage for it. Can I hear an amen? Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm keeping my eyes on. Down fear, you can get lost. But seriously, I speak that to say this. Look. I know our human tendency can be to withdraw. But I want to say to you, if that is the way it works for you, if that is your tendency to, don't. You're not called to it. Because when we get by ourselves, we have this, the problem we have is that we fall victim to a lie. And the lie comes in two parts. We hide our doubt and fear because we feel like, oh, as a Christian, I shouldn't really be struggling with doubt and fear, so I'm just never going to talk about it ever. And it's like, how are you doing today? I'm great. And they're like, internally, I have so many questions, so many doubts and fears. But if I just keep them, in, if I just keep them locked up in here, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's going to be absolutely fine. I'm like, no, that's toxic. You keep those questions buzzing around in your head, it'll drive you mad. Um, number two, number two lie is, that we somehow feel as Christians that we should be able to deal with our doubt and fear. I want you to notice what happens here. The disciples do not deal with their doubt and fear. The presence of Jesus deals with their doubt and fear. Christian, can I say to you, brother, sister, can I say to you, stop trying to overcome your doubts and fears. I hate to break it to you, you're simply not strong enough. You're not designed for it. What you're designed for is relationship with Jesus Christ, relationship with the Holy Spirit, where he meets your doubts and fears and speaks peace, and then you are filled with 
overwhelming joy. Number two, I've only got three points, guys. Our doubts and fears, and this is connected to the first, are transformed inside community. We live in a world of radical individualism, which praises, which honors, which exalts, and which lifts up the power of you being able to do it on your own. I'm a self-made person. Obviously, I wouldn't say a self-made man or woman, because, you know, obviously we live in the age where we can't talk about our genders, so we need to say person, but you get the point. Um, I am a self-made man or woman. But it's not true. None of us are. We're not self-made. We are made, we are formed, we are shaped by the community in which we live, the people we are surrounded by, much, much more than we know. And one of the things that this passage shows us is the power of community. Look at this, John 20, verses 24 and then 26. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. The first time Jesus shows up, Thomas is not there. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us why. But I love that. Because we can work out, we can, in our mind, we can go, well, I'll put in a reason. And it's probably a reason that, like, relates to you. Ask the question, what is it that sometimes keeps you from church community? I'm not going to answer that question for you, but what is it? Let me help you. You will never be transformed to a place beyond your fear and doubt outside of church community. You and I are designed for, made for, created for community. You are designed to be in deep, committed relationship and friendship with other people so that what God is doing in them both inspires and moves you and also when you are having your difficult moments that that community holds you. Look at verse 26. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and this time Thomas is with them. Whatever happened in that week, and I suspect, because if you read 25, what was 25? It was the disciples going, I've seen the Lord, I've seen the Lord, I've seen the Lord. I bet they went every single day to Thomas's house and really annoyed him. You know, he's making his like, you know, he's making his fresh flat white in the morning and like someone knocks on the door and goes, I've seen the Lord. He's like, I get it. You know, like three hours later, one of the other ones just passing by his house. I've seen the Lord. I know. You know, like all day, and he's like, I've seen, and then there was that, and then of course there's probably like another, it's probably Peter. He probably goes, I've seen the Lord, and you should come on Sunday. And he goes, all right then. Maybe he doesn't want to be there. We don't know. But the important point is he is there. Whatever the reason, whatever it is that made him come, whatever it is that changed his mind, whether it was from himself, whether it was somebody saying to him, you need to come on Sunday, he was there. And because he's there, actually, he gets to see Jesus. We like to think that when we have our personal private time with Jesus, that's the only time that we need to see Jesus. It's me and Jesus' time. The Bible has never advocated that. The Bible has always advocated that we have some of the most profound times of connection when we are with one another. It is not that the other is not important. It's just not everything. Look at this. For us. That's why in church, we always talk about groups. Because groups are not secondary to Sunday service. They are a key part of your discipleship and formation into Christ. 
Let me help you. If you do not get connected into groups, your discipleship to Jesus will plateau and stall. You will reach a point whereby, quite simply, you are not actually learning how to be with Jesus, become like Jesus, and then do the things that Jesus did. That will not happen outside community. It's not designed to be. Because when it happens in community, here's the beautiful thing about community. Community can turn around to you and say to you, whoa, I think that's a really bad idea. They will correct you and hold you when you're making or on the verge of making dumb decisions. But here's the other thing. The beautiful thing about groups is that your group will also, when you say to them, actually, I'm really struggling. Your group will be there and say, we're going to pray about that right now. I'm going to lay hands on you right now because what I see in the Bible is I see that we are called as brothers and sisters of Christ. We are anointed as ministers, whether we've got a title or not. And I'm going to put my hands on you. And like it says in the Bible, we are going to impart something of the power of the Holy Spirit to actually change something on the inside of you because we believe that transformation is not just something that happens on a Sunday. It is not just something that is spoken from the front. It is something that every single Christian is actually called to and that we should be people who are able to and confident in ministering to one another because we believe that the power of the Holy Spirit can transform anyone. And that's what we see with Thomas here. <laughs> We see that <clears throat> we see that Thomas actually comes to community, and once again Jesus breaks through a locked door. It's a week on. They've noticed the other disciples. They've seen Jesus already, but they're still locked up in the same habits. <laughs> lock the door. <laughs> lock the door. Now, don't get me wrong. Like there is an understanding of why this is the case, and at that point they were a persecuted group. What I love about this is, is that, you know, it's really easy to judge someone like Thomas. I mean, like, the poor lad, he's literally got, like, his entire name in the Bible is not Didymus. His, his name is, like in church history, is Doubting Thomas, which is a little bit unfair. Because if you look at his story, and um, this is from John 11, verse 16, they're on their way to Jerusalem. Jesus has just... Um, raised Lazarus from the dead and that they they the Jewish leaders have already said to Jesus you come back here again and we will kill you so Thomas gets it he's like I know what's going to happen look at what Thomas says Thomas apparently this doubting Thomas says in um, 11 verse 16 he says then Thomas said to the rest of the disciples let us go that we may die with him that does not sound like somebody who lacks conviction or somebody who lacks faith. Now, Thomas has faith, but he also has questions. And what I love about Thomas is, is that what we see here is that he says earlier in 25, he says, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, unless I put my finger where the nails were. Now, don't get me wrong. There's doubt in there, but you know what there also is? There's hunger. There's a desire. I want to see for myself. I don't want to build a life of Christianity where I'm living off secondhand revelation from another person. I don't want to live off somebody else's faith. Of course, I want to hear the word of God and I want to be encouraged and I want to gain revelation. Yes, but I also want to have a relationship whereby I am pursuing Jesus for myself. So what this shows us is, is that the place beyond doubt and fear, it, yes, it is a place in the presence of Jesus, but it's a place in the presence of Jesus where we are hungering after Jesus for ourselves. Are you? Would you be like Thomas? Would you be somebody who says, unless I see this for myself, and not, not out of a kind of like, you know, I have to have that personal experience, but more out of like, God, I believe that you want to reveal something to me too. God, I, want you, I believe you want to show me something. God, I believe you want to relate to me. God, I believe you want to know me, and I want to know you, and we can know each other and be fully known. He wants to see for himself. You see, I find it fascinating that, and maybe it's that hunger that drives him to go and meet with his brothers and sisters. Because they're saying, we've seen him, we've seen him, we've seen him. 
and there and he's like even if there's a tiny chance i want to go and that for me gives me hope as well i sometimes think that when we think when it comes to faith we believe our faith needs to be fully formed fully thought out we need to know the beginning from the end but i think real faith isn't like that real faith like the bible talks about it's a mustard seed you just need to plant that thing and then water it. You may not even see that anything's happened yet. But what if your step forward is just, I'm going to join a group? In groups, in this season, I'm going to decide to speak more and be a bit more honest about where I'm actually at rather than hiding behind the facade of, yeah, I'm great, Jesus reigns. <laughs> and you're like, don't get me wrong, and here's the thing, that's not untrue. It's not, that it's, not un- it's not that it's untrue, it's just, it's not authentic. And I mean that in the true, proper use of the word. It's not being real. And if there's one thing that we are called to, is we are called to bring our reality to the person of Jesus so he can transform it into faith. Real faith. Real faith comes out of being real with Christ. If you're not being real, you can't get real faith. And the final, excellent. It's changed everything, guys. Look, literally, it's 30 minutes to, I've prob- I have said to myself, I will finish on time. <laughs> and I am. <laughs> it's a beautiful day. <laughs> Number three, finally. <laughs> so, what we see here is we see, and this is the, f- the third thing I want to say, is that doubt and fear are transformed as we seek Jesus for ourselves. What we see in this dynamic, what we see in what Thomas is doing here, is that doubt and fear are transformed in the presence of Jesus. Doubt and fear are transformed by our relationship with community. And doubt and fear are transformed as we seek Jesus for ourselves. As we decide and we determine Do you know what? I am going to seek Jesus for myself. Now, I'm going to say something slightly controversial, but come with me. I think in our content-rich, saturated generation, we are surrounded by information. And in the Christian world, we are surrounded by revelation. In other words, you can listen to this message, but do you know what? The, The thing about now is you can listen to this message and if you wanted to and you know like if you don't have other responsibilities you could go home and listen to another message and then go i'm just going to listen to another message and another message and another message like we are literally surrounded by excellent content everywhere but i think one of the things that can happen here and this speaks into this doubt and fear being transformed as we seek jesus for ourselves is I think a question we need to ask ourselves is this. Have we exchanged relationship with God for revelation of God? There are moments, I think, as Christians where we can get so addicted to the content of the messages that we don't actually take time to seek God for ourselves. So we're like, I've listened to like 50 podcasts this week. Have you implemented anything from those 50 podcasts? I've listened to 50 podcasts this week. Yeah, I'm asking you the question, have you implemented anything you heard in those podcasts? I've listened to 50 podcasts this week. <laughs> you know, like, and we're like, and like as Christians, we, we develop these kind of like unhealthy habits where we're like, you know, when people ask us difficult questions, we go, oh, but I'm just, I'm expecting things to happen. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Move on. You know, like, and we can get so wrapped up in sometimes kind of like almost like, as it were, 
the demonstration of our faith in that kind of like everything's all good and fantastic and amazing and I, I don't have any problems ever or at least if I do have problems I bring them to Jesus and he's awesome um praise Jesus you know like whereas actually actually like I think what I love about the story of Thomas is is Thomas comes with real questions he's coming with real expectation and his expectation is and here's the imagine the condescension of Jesus he said, unless I see him, unless I see where those nails were, and unless I see the hole in his side, I'm not believing. Jesus turns up. If I was Jesus, I'd be like, I flipping just rose from the dead. <laughs> Proof enough for you, Thomas. You shall now be doubting, Thomas. I write it in the Bible. John, write that down. <laughs> it's a good line. Instead of that, like Jesus in like his grace and mercy and goodness, he turns up and he says, here you go. You want proof? Let me show you. He invites him and says, put your hands here. And I speak to every single one of us who has real questions about your faith. Have you actually had the boldness, the audacity to go to God and go, show me then. I will not believe until you show me. And again, maybe lose some of Thomas's, Thomas's like doubt inside because Jesus does say, don't doubt, believe. But maybe you come and go, God, I want to know this for myself. God, I want to see this for myself. I don't want to just read about a move of God. I want to be a move of God. I don't want to just prophesy that there is a move of God taking place in Sunderland and that God, that you are doing something in this church, in this group and community of people. God, I want to be somebody who participates. What I love about what Jesus does here is by actually in his grace and mercy saying, see, he invites, he invites Thomas say, participate. Come and play your part. Come and see for yourself. Come and touch for yourself. I wonder sometimes when we think about Easter, we think about the fact that it's given us access to God. What if the other side of Easter is also that God now has access to you? That just as we want to be touched by God, God is saying, I want to touch you. I want to touch you with the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to anoint you for things that you don't think you deserve. You don't think that you are qualified for because here's what, here's what Jesus is saying. Because notice he says the same thing over all the disciples. He says, peace be with you, peace be with you. Do they deserve any of it? No, it is all grace. And it's still all grace today. Jesus wants to touch you by the power of the Holy Spirit. You need to get over yourself and get over the fact that you don't think that actually you have the right skill set for it. Let me be really clear. I don't. Cat doesn't. None of us in here have the right skill set for this. But what we do have is we have the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit. And that gives us an edge way beyond any skill set, qualification, any sense of kind of like my self-value. You know, like, I mean, what even is that? my self-value. My value is not in myself. My value is in Christ in the fact that my life is hidden with him and I look towards him for my value. And when he says I am utterly valuable and that I am, even in my weirdnesses and oddnesses, um, uniqueness guys, that's what we call it. Even in my uniqueness, I, you know, I am fearfully and wonderfully made and I am on a journey of becoming more loving and more like him. So as we come to a close right now. <coughs> oh. Water. <laughs> Sorry. <sighs> I'm just embracing my uniqueness this morning. <clears throat> like, let's... As we finish up right now, I want to tell you about Thomas. I want to tell you about how his life closes out. Thomas goes on to be one of the apostles of the early church. And in church tradition, he is called Saint Thomas. And he's called Saint Thomas because by the urging of the Holy Spirit, he felt that he was called to bring the gospel to India. 
which did not know anything about the gospel. He went to India to try and convert people to Christianity. He was martyred for his faith, but he refused to give his faith up. The story of the early church fathers is of a group of scared and doubting ordinary men and women like you and me who because of Easter and because they chose to live in the light of Easter of being a resurrection people and they held on to you well this means that Jesus is coming again that's my compass my compass is not what I'm going through in the present my compass is Jesus one day will come again and that led most of them to being martyred for their faith. Most of them died. John's the only one who didn't. He got to live on an island. Because they couldn't shut him up. So they thought the best thing we can do is take him away from any human contact. But then he just wrote and sent letters. Then those people, those churches were emboldened and empowered by those letters. And then they loved those letters so much they said, right, somebody in this church, we need to write these letters down. Let's make a copy. And then those people made copies. And then those people made copies. And those people made copies. And they felt that the power in these words was so true and so powerful and so um, and had such an ability to do something holy and unfathomably be brilliant in their lives that they passed it on. And years and years and years go by. And eventually what happens is, is that these writings are then collected by later Christians, part of this story that has endured and continued for thousands of years. And they printed it and they put it together and then they put it together into a Bible. And then they have, they now have a Bible and then they, they invent the printing press. And what then happens is, is that that group of church people those people who had been building cathedrals they go do you know what we need to do we need to siphon some of the money that's been going to building church cathedrals we need to take some of that money and we need to pour it into this brand new thing called the printing press and we're going to pour money into the printing press and do you know what we're going to do we're going to print bibles and we're going to print bibles because the bible is the living and active word of god and it's the only thing that has the power to change a human heart it's the only thing that has the power to actually transform us and change us and break us out of the prison of fear and doubt that we so often live in because we believe that Easter is the turning point of human history. It is the moment where Jesus rises again from the dead and he speaks and he prophesies that sin and death and everything associated with it, including fear and doubt, no longer has supremacy. It no longer has control. It no longer has power over us as human beings because we are the children of light and the light has no power over the darkness. No, it is the darkness that obeys is the power of the light because where there is light darkness is the one that flees and that that is the reality that we're called to live in and those people realized that when they were printing these bibles they'd say do you know what we need to print them in every single language possible because this message is the message of life for every single human being and saints after saints after saints after saints have given their lives they have given their wealth they have given their land they have given their fortune so that this message of life may go out and I believe this morning that what Jesus is saying is that this series is about saying this changes everything it is time for us as a church to rise up and to recognize that we are not just brothers and sisters in Christ we are the saints of the living God and as saints we will give everything we will give whatever we have because we recognize that what we have in this world is not and cannot actually truly ever make us happy but it we can live in light of eternity we can live in light of the fact that Jesus is coming again and that when Jesus comes again he will make everything right and we are called to sacrifice to serve to love and when we get to the end of ourselves, we get to a place where we say, I've got to the end of my I've got to the end of myself because I've not been spending enough time with the Holy Spirit. What we do is we go into that place and say, Holy Spirit, fill me up again. Holy Spirit, anoint me with fresh oil. I'm going to make my home in the family of God and I'm going to come every Sunday believing I'm going to come to my group, believing that when they pray over me, where the Lord, that I am going to learn how to experience the power of the Holy Spirit every single day in my life because I cannot live without it. We need to be that kind of radical generation. 
And do you know what? It's not just a generational thing. Every single generation is called to this. What I've just talked about there is a generation who got the message and who passed it on. We are that generation. Whether you are 57, 47, like some people, um, and then, or younger, apparently there's an age younger than 47, that we're called to be an intergenerational family. We carry the message.